Uh, what I'm going to do is provide a little bit of context for the most incredible series of events that have happened over the last couple of weeks between the US and China. I'm sure a lot of you are interested in knowing what, what the background to this is and what the, what the drivers are. So let me just uh, do that by very briefly summarizing the core arguments that I've made in this uh, paper that I have written for the Heinrich Foundation, looking at the ways in which the US-China conflict can be de-risked, if that's possible. So the first point I want to make is that, like most major conflicts, uh, these things don't, don't start overnight. They have a long genesis. And I think the problem with US-China, if you want to understand the drivers of the current conflict, you have to go back 10 or 15 years to understand how China made some poor decisions back in the early noughties, if you like, uh, as to its place in the world and, and its relationship with the United States. And if I can just pull out three core uh, decisions I think were made in China. The first is that the Chinese uh, Communist Party and the government at the time uh, made a decision that China needed to reassert itself if it wanted to uh, return to its historical position in Asia and perhaps even globally as, as, the, as, the, as the major nation in East Asia. And in order to do that, the one lesson I took away from the fall of the Soviet Union is that, the, that China had to be strong economically and financially, not just militarily. Otherwise, China could never become a major power. And I think that was a, a reasonable uh, analysis at the time. So China, so the Chinese government put enormous resources into building up capacity across the board in, uh, in the economy, finance, in the military domain, and particularly in strategic industries. These are the industries that uh, Beijing had decided would be critical to preeminence in the 21st century. Uh, the commanding heights, if you like, or the commanding tech heights of the future economy. And the problem with that was that in order to be number one in all these strategic industries, robotics, artificial intelligence, new materials, uh, all these areas, biotechnology, it essentially required other countries to be number two. And the United States was certainly not going to take that line down. So already you could see the tension developing uh, throughout those decades where on trade issues, on intellectual property, of course, which goes to the heart of technology, uh, the US was starting to be very concerned about what this would mean for the relationship and for the United States preeminence in the world if China was successful. And then, you, of course, you had the military build up by China and China has quite rightly argued that it, it had every right to modernise its armed forces. But the perception in the US was that this was not just a modernization program. It was actually a program designed to challenge the US military, militarily, particularly in the Western Pacific and perhaps even globally over time. And initially, the Obama administration uh, tried to push back fairly gently on some of these things. Um, but it wasn't until the Trump administration came to power that you started to see US pushback against China in all these domains. It started off with the trade conflict or the trade war uh, a couple of years ago, but really it's clearly not about trade. It's about much uh, more fundamental things. And if I, if I was to summarise in one sentence, it really is a contest between the two major powers of the day as to which of them is going to be the number one power in the 21st century. Um, and unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be a lot of room for compromise on that question at the moment. So that, that is the core issue. It's essentially a geopolitical one. But the trade and tech conflicts, though important in themselves, are symptomatic of the broader contest, the broader competition between these two powers. Now, I have to characterise this as um, potentially leading to a new Cold War. When I first argued this six months ago, um, I got a lot of pushback from some of my colleagues and I thought it was premature or I thought it was wishful thinking. Uh, but uh, if you pick up the papers today or turn on your radio or television, you will see that everybody now, unfortunately, is talking about the possibility of a new Cold War. And it's a measure of how much the tensions between the US and China have escalated over the last three months. But now it's becoming very commonplace to talk about a new Cold War. Now, is that a valid comparison? Well, look, in, in summary, I think it is because there are many, many 
uh, parallels between what is happening now between the US and China and what happened between the US and the Soviet Union during the first Cold War. I'll just highlight a couple. This is clearly a contest, as I said, for preeminence between the two major powers of the day. But one is a liberal democracy and one is an authoritarian state. So there's a values kind of clash there. Um, it's ideological. This is not the ordinary great power conflict. We've had many of these over, over, the, over the centuries, but this one has an ideological dimension. It's a systemic challenge for both countries. It's about values as well as their political system. That's what makes it so difficult to reconcile. So I think that is a valid comparison. The key difference, of course, is that the US and China are far more interdependent economically than the Soviet Union and the United States was. Now, a lot of people say, well, that means there's not going to be a Cold War, but I beg to differ because I think that very difference, the fact that there is this independence, interdependence, actually makes conflict more likely rather than less likely. And this is contrary to conventional thinking, that if you have a close trading relationship with a country, it's probably peace-inducing. But I think under certain circumstances, it can generate conflict when one or both countries feels that their interdependence has become over-dependence on the other country. That is, it's a source of national vulnerability. And I think that's exactly what has happened with the US and China, particularly over the last six months. And you're starting to see now both countries decouple from each other's economic and tech systems. And the problem for the rest of the world is that if this continues and accelerates, as I think it will, it's going to draw the rest of the world in and it could potentially lead to the sorts of visions that we had in the first Cold War. So what becomes a trade conflict then morphs into a tech war and then a geopolitical conflict and a bifurcation of the world into two competing blocks. Uh, and you can see that playing out in the differences over the internet, over a whole range of tech issues. So that is the real risk for everybody. It's not just the US and China. Now, just to, to bring us up to sort of the, the last few days, so that's the context, I think, in which we need to look at what's happening between the US and China now. It is not something uh, that's peripheral. It's not something that just happened over the last few months. It's been years in the making. And the problem is now we've got the three likely outcomes. And the first is we all hope there be some form of reconciliation or at least a new equilibrium between the US and China. I don't see that happening at the moment. Perhaps in the longer term it will, but at the moment it's hard to see. The other two options are separation or what I call divorce. Separation would be some degree of decoupling, but not totally decoupling. Divorce, of course, the divorce scenario, which you, if you have a complete breakdown of relations between the US and China. I don't think that will happen, but it's going to get very messy and uh, we're going, if things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. And then the game, then, then the sort of, you have to ask yourself the question, how can we get out of this escalating conflict? It's not just a, a, a question for the US and China, nor is it a decision for the US and Chinese policymakers. It's one that involves the whole world. And as an Australian, as a, someone from the land down under, I mean, we, we, we feel that we're being squeezed between the US and China on the, in this conflict, as do many other countries. So we're all actually now motivated to think, what can we do to reduce tensions? And I set that out in the Heinrich report that I've written. I have set out a number of uh, uh, courses of action that I think will help. And we can talk about those later on if that's, if that's convenient. So look, I think I'll leave it there. That's just my sort of opening comments. I'm happy to talk about some of the recent developments, uh, including the... Um, closing down of the Chinese consulate in Houston, which, of course, is the hot news at the moment. But, but I, if I just might pass it back to you, Sami, and uh, you can take it from there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, we'll run through uh, equilibrium uh, separation and divorce again, I'm sure, over the course of, of this. Uh, I should say for everyone that um, Alan's paper is available to download on the Zoom invite, which you all received. It's also on our website, and resources will be posted on the website. This broadcast is being recorded and you can watch the YouTube video afterwards again from our website. Um, and finally, I should just mention, um, because of Alan, what you just said about interdependence. As most of you know, this is one of a series of uh, programs that we're doing with our partner, the Heinrich Foundation on international trade.
and all of the previous uh, ones on our, are on our website. But two weeks ago, we did a program on rare earths and the uh, specific um, conflict uh, and the sense, the extreme sense of vulnerability uh, by the United States because of its um, dependence on, on China for rare earths. So um, back to your point that in fact, um, dependence and, and, and coupling can actually increase the risk of conflict. Um, I invite you all to look at that. Um, very interesting, um, both for its uh, both for the facts about the rare earth situation, which are uh, rather surprising, but also for what it says uh, about the future of, of the relationship and the risk of dependence. Um, Alan, let me bring you back to your uh, comment about um, the, the the country squeezed um, between the United States and China, and essentially being asked to to, to take sides in in what is becoming an uh, an increasingly uncomfortable uh, conflict. Um, could you talk about what's happening not just with Australia and of course the barley and all that, but in some of the other countries, uh, Canada, Germany, that are also uh, finding themselves kind of caught in the middle between the United States and China? Yes, well, it's just becoming. Uh a really big problem for everybody. If I just look at, if I start off with the Asian region. So uh, a couple of years ago, everybody felt that China's rise was mutually beneficial. Um, most of China's, well, China is virtually all the countries of Asia's major trading partner, including Australia. So um, there's been some dismay and disappointment in a lot of countries about China's assertiveness over the last few years, including in the trade domain, where there is a feeling, a growing feeling, it's quite widespread actually, that China, um, in order to pursue its strategic ambitions, is start, starting to use trade, uh, weaponized trade, and use it as a tool of coercion. Now, this is, of course, contested by China, but if you actually look at what's happening in the region, you see numerous examples where China has actually has weaponized trade. And I'll just give you a few quick examples. Um, if you go back uh, with rare earths with Japan, there was, a, there was a period of time when China sought to deliver a message to Japan by actually uh, delaying supplies of rare earths to Japan. Then we had the instance of the same thing with, with banana exports from the Philippines, when there was a falling out over the one of the Scrappy Islands, Scarborough Reef, where China appeared to be applying a trade pressure on the Philippines for strategic reasons. And then many other countries have experienced the same thing. Uh, canola with Canada. Um, if you look at South Korea, uh, South Korea, the company, South Korean company, Lotte, was punished for allowing a anti-missile radar system to be put on its golf course in Seoul. It's an American system. And the Chinese essentially boycotted Lotte and Lotte now is having to pull out a lot of the stores from, from China. And in Australia, uh, we feel that uh, China has uh, basically put pressure on us in terms of our uh, coal uh, and our beef and also barley. Uh, these are not things that have just happened coincidentally. They look clearly related to China delivering a message to Australia that we need to toe the line on some issues that they're not happy with us about, notably our Prime Minister's decision to ask for an independent inquiry into the COVID-19, the origins of the, of the pandemic. China seemed to take offence at that and then straight almost immediately afterwards, uh, we were criticised heavily. We were talked about as being chewing gum on the shoe of China and relations deteriorated very sharply. So there's been a lot of uh, concern in Australia about that and many other countries. John, I can give you many other examples. But that, so the point I'm trying to make here is that the tensions between the US and China are being replicated elsewhere. It's not just a US-China conflict. It's not just only the US and China. Uh, a lot of countries in the region that are, were naturally pro-China are now starting to be concerned about China's behaviour. Uh, and that's now quite widespread, including in Europe. Okay. Um, so one last question before we turn this over to Dr. Jia. Um, and you're a former diplomat. Um, one of the um, most famous uh, diplomats of the 20th century in US-China relations, Richard Solomon, wrote a famous book on uh, Chinese negotiating behavior in which he said that the art of negotiating with the Chinese is to build a ladder on which Beijing can climb down. 
Um, you have some recommendations for climbing down. I understand that this is perhaps an ill-timed question because the mood in Washington is not uh, about climbing down. Um, but could you just talk a little bit about uh, what you think a de-escalation strategy could look like? Yes, well, I think the first point I'd make is that both the US and China have to climb down that ladder together, okay? It's not just a question of one country having to do it. And how would you do it? Well, the first thing I would suggest is you've got to look at the language, the, the um, words of bullets in diplomacy, as we say. And the rhetoric, unfortunately, has become quite hostile and aggressive on both sides. So the first thing is you have to manage the rhetoric tone down the language and give everybody a bit of a breathing space. Then some of these, these, these kind of core issues between the US and China have to be negotiated. There's no alternative to that. If you want to actually de-escalate, you've got to actually come to grips with the core issues. Uh, and I've sort of itemised a lot of those, but just very quickly, you know, some of the tech issues, the, the concerns about IP theft in the United States, um, cyber cyber threats from China. Now, China has denied these things, of course, but there has to be some meeting, some dialogue between the two countries and come to grips with this, as occurred between the Soviet Union and the United States during the first Cold War. They were quite, they were able to resolve some of their differences. If not resolve them, they at least came to a modus vivendi, a kind of working relationship that they got on with that. So that, that, there will be some of the uh, examples of things I think we need to do on both sides of this. So both countries have to have to be prepared to make some compromises. Otherwise, we are going to get continued escalation. And of course, the risk is that that lead goes from a cold war to a hot war. Uh, and that's, of course, you know, nobody's interest, and everyone understands that. The risk is that the more tensions you have, um, and if they remain unresolved, then you just need one thing to go wrong, some miscalculation, and some you're into a, in the beginning of a hot war. And that would be quite disastrous for the world, particularly at the time when COVID-19 is ravaging the global economy. The last thing we need is to have a military conflict between the US and China. Okay, thank you so much. All right, Dr. Jha, let me turn it over to you. Um, risk of escalation uh, generally perceived to be rising. Can you tell us about the mood in Beijing, particularly in the last few days, as the um, relations seem to have taken a sharp turn for the worse? Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, the mood in Beijing is not good. <laughs> uh, actually, for some time now, uh, people see provocations from Washington. Uh, some people argue that it's not about money anymore. It's not about getting a better deal or, or, or worse deal anymore. It's about life. In other words, the U.S. wants to destroy China, and the China has to stand up, stand up to it. Uh, this is the mood. Uh, increasingly, this is shared by the population uh, because of the repeated uh, provocations from Washington. Uh, the topic of this panel is managing relate China-U.S. Cold War. I've been reflecting on this since uh, Sonny asked me to join the panel. <laughs> Are China and the US in the Cold War? I think to answer this question, we need to clarify what Cold War means. In history, there was only one Cold War. Uh, that is between the US and the Soviet Union. That Cold War had three distinct characteristics. Ideological rivalry, military confrontation, and economic separation. If this is what we mean by the Cold War, we're not quite there yet. China has not come up with an ideology to rival the US, despite the allegations. Except some skirmishes in the South China Sea between the two militaries, the US and China are not engaged in an all-out military confrontation. And despite the trade and high-tech war, our economies are still very much connected and intertwined. But I'm sorry to say that we are heading in that direction. And with great speed, 
and accelerating speed uh, thanks to the Trump administration. The most recent indication is the administration's decision to close China's uh, uh, consulate general in Houston in 24 hours. If the current momentum continues, I think the two countries are likely to end up in a Cold War and maybe even in a hot time. Why have things happened this way? Why in a few years time, the relationship has deteriorated so drastically? There are many reasons. One is that China has not developed and behaved according to the expectation of many Americans. Instead of becoming more like the US, China has become more, has less, has become less like the US, especially in recent years. Uh, so some Americans are very frustrated and concerned. China's continued rise fueled their frustration and they begin to imagine and often exaggerate what this China can do to the US. Uh, you know, our trade is about interdependence. In the old days, it's not a problem. Now it's a problem. Technology is interdependent. In the old days, it was not a problem. Now it's a problem. We can see this uh, in a lot of uh, uh, areas. So as a result, uh, there is widespread sentiment in Washington, especially in the Congress, that China uh, is the trouble, the problem, uh, the threat even. In the second place, China, the U.S. has not developed according to the American expectations. Uh, that's the second factor. For various reasons, the U.S. finds it difficult to deal with its own problems like upgrading its infrastructure, providing medical care for all, uh, solving the drug abuse problem, uh, eradicate racial discrimination, and also the fact that many Americans are left behind, despite the fact that the US has benefited tremendously from globalization. Many Americans are frustrated and angry. That's why Donald Trump had a chance to be elected. After his election, he found it impossible to deal with the domestic problems that, uh, also. So he resorted to blaming other countries for American problems with the hope that he can force other countries to finance his, global, his goal of making America great again. Since China is the second largest economy and practices a very different political system, China naturally became his primary target. In the third place, the third factor, the Trump administration's failure to address the COVID-19 pandemic has led, to his, uh, has led to infection and death of so many American life, uh, Americans. The failure is so much glaring in the light of the fact that China handled the pandemic issue much more efficiently. Instead of, all, instead of reflecting on its own problems, the administration chose to blame China as well as the WTO, the Obama, for its failure. Thus, we hear the administration deliberately talking about the so-called China virus and, uh, and 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 uh, allege uh, all all kinds of allegations uh, about China created this virus. Finally, the dwindling chance of re-election has contributed to the recent intensification of the Trump's anti-China campaign. Having failed to fight the virus and revive the economy. Trump appears to be believed that the only way for him to get reelected is to provoke all out confrontation with China. The logic is if China and the US are in all out confrontation, 
he could rally Americans against the China evil and get reelected along the way. Thus, we see provocation after not one after another, ranging from Hong Kong to South China Sea to Taiwan, and most recently to the closure of the Chinese consulate general in Houston. These are just, there are at least two huge ironies uh, in this process. Irony one in its effort to promote, uh, to provoke a confrontation. The Trump administration has come up with a lot of lies and half truths as excuses such as debt trap when it comes to China's Belt and Road Initiative. China's development as a result of the American intellectual property, uh, theft of American intellectual property rights. China has ripped off the Americans. China has engaged in ethnic cleansing in Xinjiang. Americans have no problem with the fact that the administration lies and misrepresents the facts at home. But when it comes to China, many chose to not to question the validity of such allegations. Irony too, by endorsing the Trump administration's ill-intended approach to China, the Democrats put themselves in a lose-lose situation. If Trump is successful in rallying Americans in a historical epic hate war against China, he may get reelected. If Trump loses the election, a Democratic administration would find the U.S. in a, com in a confrontation with China which would consume a lot of American resources mm -hmm. to make the U.S. great again. How to manage the relationship in the future? First, I think people of the two countries should cool down and carefully assess the nature of the relationship. We are very different countries, uh, especially in terms of uh, political system. At the same time, we are also countries of the same kind. Uh, by countries of the same kind, I mean China and the U.S. are both stakeholders of the existing international order. Both countries want peace and stability. Both countries want free and open trade. Both countries want to have more effective global governance to address various kinds of global challenges, ranging from unbalance in economic development and proliferation of mad weapons of mass destruction from the pandemic to climate change. Second, the two countries should take a more pragmatic approach in handling their relationship. In other words, they should cooperate where they can, where they should, and manage their differences where they have to. Third, they should compete for the better, not for the worse. The U.S. should learn from China in upgrading its infrastructure and making its streets safe. China should learn from the U.S. in better protecting its people's individual rights and, the in, and, and interests. There is no intellectual property rights in such kind of competition. Such kind of competition will not, will not only benefit uh, the people of both countries, but also the humankind. Finally, they should engage in dialogue and negotiation on the framework and code of conduct in such kind of competition so that they can compete with a certain level of fairness. For that to happen, both have to be prepared to, to give and take rather than try to impose it on the other. The relationship between China and the US is in a state of crisis crisis can lead to disaster. It can also lead to opportunities. It's time for people of the two countries to make efforts to avoid disaster and embrace opportunities. About 40 years ago, I went to the U.S. to study. I was lucky to have a fellowship from Cornell University. When I was choosing my major, I decided to study international relations. The reason is simple. Since Chinese people underwrote my education before college, uh, uh, up to college, and since the American people paid for my graduate studies, I should do something to help promote mutual understanding between our two great countries.
for better for the better part of the past decades, I was happy that the relations between the two countries improved tremendously despite all kinds of problems. And the people in both countries have benefited hugely from this development. In the last few years, I felt frustrated and disappointed to see that it is moving in the wrong direction, that is toward confrontation. I cannot imagine how the two countries can benefit from confrontation and war. When I first came to the US almost 40 years ago, I was very much impressed by the warmth, friendliness, generosity, tolerance, and confidence of this great country. I regard the US as my second home. I must tell you now that I miss it. I hope one day I'll feel the same way again. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Jaff, for those very sobering remarks. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in um, and um, I will take just one of them and then I promise to come back at the end before Anna. Um, Dr. Jad, there's a number of, um, in the questions, there's a sort of general theme, which is to say that China is blaming the Trump administration, um, uh, but the, uh, the countries in Southeast Asia really do feel threatened um, by, by uh, Chinese provocation, just as China feels threatened um, by the United States uh, provocation. So for example, in the Philippines and um, uh, elsewhere, um, uh, China's rejection, for example, of the uh, 2006 ruling on the South China Sea, which has, um, I think, sent shockwaves through um, the US Congress and elsewhere. How do you respond to that? Does, is there any mood in China to tone things down in the South China Sea, for example, in order to, to, to cool things off? Or is that just off the table for the moment? Yeah, it's a problem in the South China Sea. I think um, China's claims have not changed for many years. Uh, even up to now, China has no uh, additional claims uh, as far as South China Sea is concerned. China made the, those claims many years ago. What what was different uh, was that uh, because of China's rise, uh, in the old days, uh, Chinese government told its people that uh, we have we cannot do very much about the about the uh, our claimed uh, territories uh, uh, and and the uh, maritime rights uh, because we are too weak. Uh, and then China became strong, and then the people pressure on Chinese government increased. So China did more to uh, reassert its rights. Uh, whether this is a wise idea or not, uh, that's debatable. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, from the Chinese perspective, uh, China has not done anything wrong. But, um, but I think China realizes that uh, uh, the, the, the problem cannot be resolved, uh, with, however you, you try to push it. Uh, so China began to uh, uh, cool down and try to uh, uh, work with other countries to, to uh, negotiate a code of conduct agreement. Uh, uh, so, but just as the, the situation became cool down, uh, the U.S. military became very active. Uh, and then we had a new situation. Uh, now, it's not between China and the Southeast Asian country, uh, well, the concerned Southeast Asian countries anymore. It's like uh, the South China Sea became a China-U.S. problem. Uh, this is unfortunate. Uh, uh, I hope, uh, and, the, and the vessels, military vessels are getting closer and closer and more and more frequently uh, to, to, with each other, and this is this is creating a very dangerous situation. Uh, I just hope that our two countries are not getting into a military conflict because of an unintended uh, accident. Okay, so thank you. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Anna for a moment. Um, as you know, Anna is a correspondent for the New York Times, previously with the Washington Post, has covered international economics for many years.
Um, we're going to ask Anna both for the view from Washington, but also for tips uh, for journalists who are covering, uh, attempting to cover this um, increasingly um, bitter conflict in a very partisan environment. Um, I'd also like to put in a plug for Anna's recent story yesterday in the New York Times. It'll also be posted on our website, um, going through the the um, the kind of failed uh, decoupling, I guess, um, and talking about how many um, uh, corporations that are not, in fact, moving their um, move, that may be moving their supply chains out of China, but that are not bringing them home, but rather moving them to lower wage, uh, lower cost countries like uh, Mexico. Um, uh, Vietnam and so on. Um, so Anna, I'll let you talk about that. I just want to ask you overall uh, about the overall situation in um, in Washington now. Um, a lot of the focus of this panel and many discussions is on the Trump administration, but I think um, it's quite clear now that Congress, I mean, there are no more panda huggers in Congress. They are extinct. Um, so it's, you know, trade and it's human rights and it's, you know, China's double di digit defense buildup and it's, you know, the South China Sea ruling in 2006 and more recently concerns about e economic espionage. Um, you know, how does this situation change when it's not simply just the Trump administration that's increasingly belligerent, but rather uh, Congress and, and uh, whether or not you agree with Dr. Jha, the Democrats are not in really a position where they can actually be seen as, you know, soft on China in an election year. So can you give us the 30,000 foot view before we go on to trade? Absolutely. Yeah. And thank you so much for having me on this, um, this panel, really timely topic. Um, so I, I agree, there's absolutely an escalation of tensions across um, trade, technology, intelligence, that seems somewhat irreversible, regardless of which uh, party wins the election in November. And, you know, there are really several factors that are making that conflict um, in, in technology, um, in uh, security, much more inevitable, including the emergence of next generation technologies, um, you know, the rising importance for industries and governments of data collection, the digital divide between the United States and China, as well as China's growing geopolitical heft in the South China Sea and with its uh, Belt and Road Initiative that um, some of the other panelists were just discussing. And I do think the election um, is playing into that worsening of tensions as well. Um, both uh, President Trump and Vice President Biden are running ads accusing the other of being soft on China with very similar language. Um, and both campaigns seem to think that this is an issue that will resonate and motivate voters, which I think is interesting to me. Um, I, I don't recall uh, international relations extending quite that much into the popular election. Uh, in recent years. And to some extent, I think the Chinese do understand how rhetoric works in our election cycle, but this is adding fuel at a very explosive time for the relationship in general. Um, just a few thoughts about, um, you know, what, what this might look like under a second Trump administration or a Biden administration. Um, for the Trump administration, we've actually, I think, kind of morphed from a trade war into more of a tech um, and intel war recently. Um, after several years of tit-for-tat trade war, um, ironically, trade now looks like kind of a more durable part of the U.S.-China relationship under, under the Trump administration, um, because the administration administration has invested time and energy in reaching this trade deal. And I think, you know, at least for now, both sides see um, little benefit in rip it, ripping up that phase one trade deal. Um, so it seems like the deal and the, the tariff truce between the countries could survive through November, um, but whether it could su survive a full uh, second um, Trump term, I'm not sure. Uh, the president, of course, is kind of famously, um, uh, you know, impulsive in, in terms of um, using the tariff threats. So we could see a return to tensions for sure. Um, a Biden administration, you know, while they're also taking a tough tone on China, I think um, looks like it would take a somewhat different tact. Um, my understanding is that they say they will assess tariffs on China based on their impact on the American middle class. Um, but they could also be hesitant, I think, to roll off all the tariffs without getting something substantial from China in return. Um, you also see some similar rhetoric from the Biden administration about bringing manufacturing back to the United States and the importance of buying American. Um, 
but the way they go about that might be different. You know, the president, President Trump relied heavily on tariffs as well as some other changes to the trade rules that they saw as incentives for offshoring. But for the Biden administration, there's been a lot more conversation about domestic funding for, you know, basic research and manufacturing facilities. And the Biden campaign has promised to focus more on domestic issues before moving on to rewriting trade deals. Um, the other main difference um, I see the Biden campaign emphasizing is working with allies to push China to change. Um, and engagement has become kind of a dirty word now, but it does seem like the Biden administration would look to engage with China on some compartmentalized aspects of the relationship, like climate change in North Korea, even as it is confronting China on others. Um, but you're right, it's not a safe time politically to be friendly to China. And I don't think you're going to see much of that from Congress or either campaign. Um, and at the same time, you know, many of the institutions that form more basic connections between our countries are being eroded. Um, people often talk about the business community losing trust and no longer being a ballast in the relationship. And that's definitely been an important factor. Um, but increasingly, I think you're seeing that change underway with students and journalists and even scientists as well. Um, the Trump administration just canceled the Fulbright program in Hong Kong and China, for example. You have journalists on both sides being kicked out of the country. Um, there's a growing environment of suspicion um, surrounding uh, scientists and researchers and grad students. Um, and that's one thing I really worry about that that you know, basic foundation of the relationship is eroding. And that means that it's easier for both sides to lose touch with a basic understanding of the other and a sense of connection with the other, and that that would increase the probability of war. Well, thank you, Anna. And I, um, I, I hear what you're saying. I think we had uh, about the journalists and the um, uh, students and the um, what happens to people like, you know, Dr. Ja, who was trained at Cornell and who came back and became sort of a figure known for, for being a bridge to the two countries? Are we breaking uh, the bonds of the future um, for sort of a short-term uh, short gain? Um, can I go back to the, some of the, the trade issues? Um, you talked about the, the, um, the, you know, the collapse of some of the institutions that have been the bulwark of the liberal democratic border, such as it is. Um, a month ago, uh, Bob Davis, your competitor at the Wall Street Journal, was uh, was with us, and he predicted that uh, Trump would definitely would pull out of the WTO without question, uh, were he to be reelected. Uh, but since making that threat, he hasn't really done anything. Um, and he also was. We were talking about what would be the 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 likely um, uh, position of the Biden administration toward the WTO in terms of some of what are perceived to be the uh, deficiencies in the WTO to enforce um, actions um, in particularly, quote unquote, to discipline China and its you know, failure to do so. And you know, what is the future of this institution? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that the WTO is really going to be a major factor in this election. But nonetheless, could you talk about how you think that might uh, play out in future? Yeah, absolutely. That's an interesting topic. And Bob Davis, of course, is a formidable competitor and has a great new book out that I just finished reading. So um, so I think, um, you know, the Trump administration has obviously been extremely critical of the WTO. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the major actions is blocking appointments to the appellate body, um, which has basically um, caused the dispute resolution of uh, arm of the WTO to cease to function. So um, the Trump administration argues that the WTO has become a forum for litigation rather than negotiation. And so, um, you know, it's fine to kind of um, cripple that part of the WTO and hopefully negotiations will continue to go forward. However, in practice, you are not really seeing a lot of progress with the negotiating arm either. So I think it's, you know, not necessarily a question of, um, I mean, the, the Trump administration doesn't need to pull out of the WTO in order to have it wither and become, um, you know, ineffective and um, in, in our international system. And you're absolutely seeing that. So I do, I do think another Trump term would result in the continued weakening of that um, international infrastructure, which um, the Trump administration um, seems okay with. Um, it also depends a lot on 
who the trade representative is, I think, for the next Trump term. It's unclear to me if um, Bob Lighthizer, the current USTR, would stay on. Um, but I think that, you know, I'm kind of hearing that he may not. Um, and, you know, in which case, I, you know, I think it hinges a lot on who they select for that position. Um, because, you know, Bob Lighthizer clearly is extremely critical of the WTO on many points, but also doesn't support withdrawing from it entirely. And so I think that's why you, we haven't actually <laughs> left that institution. Um, so the US is simultaneously, you know, being extremely tough on the WTO in some areas, but also pushing for certain reforms so like, um, changes to, you know, who can call themselves a developing country. Um, so, you know, right now the institution is just kind of limping along. That could be the future um, with a second Trump term, or you could have somebody come in as USDR who really believes in withdrawing from that organization. Okay. Um, we've got some questions. We've got many questions in here, but I want to pick up on something that you said, and this is a question uh, for Dr. Ja, having to do with the business community, where you say that the business community was, you know, traditionally a restraint on um, uh, posturing or provocation to China because it was the relationship was just continued, you know, considered to be too valuable to mess up. Um, question here from Hong Kong, I believe. Um, historically, American business has always supported uh, good US-China relations, but China has somehow lost that support for insisting on tech transfer and other unfair practices. Um, do you think the Chinese government, Dr. Jia, has recognized such mistake and is it prepared to change course? Uh, certainly, uh, the Chinese government has uh, paid attention to that. Actually, last year, I believe that China the legislature passed a law to uh, protect uh, foreign companies, uh, foreign investment. Uh, it's called foreign investment law. In that law, specific, it specifies the, 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 the requirement mm -hmm. uh, for local governments, for all government departments, not to uh, compel uh, any company to transfer their, tech, uh, their technology. Uh, in exchange for market. So uh, China did pay attention to that. And also when we talk about American business, most American business are making money in China. Uh, actually, uh, China market is uh, one of their best uh, source of income. Uh, uh, so uh, at the moment, uh, in, originally, uh, they, 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 they became a bit... Uh, uh, moderate, uh, well, uh, they, they took a low, low key uh, because uh, they want the administration to put some pressure on China to, to address some of their grievances. But now I think they are sort of uh, intimidated uh, uh, by the Trump administration uh, in, in terms of for, for, for uh, uh, if they say something, then they, they will be pro-China or they'll, they'll, they'll put their business interests in front of security interests of the US. So, so now they are sort of subdued, uh, even though they still want to uh, keep uh, uh, in their investment with China, in China. Okay, thank you. Um, Anna, one more question before we go to tips to journalists, and that is, do you think that the law, is there any, um, do, well, do, do American companies believe that the, the law, the regulation that China passed, um, on uh, uh, banning uh, essentially technological espionage or, or forced trans technological transfer. Uh, is there any evidence that that's being enforced? I mean, is that seen as credible by the US business community? Um, I mean, I heard a lot of questions about it from the US business community, you know, specifically questions surrounding how it would be enforced. I mean, I think there's agreement that sort of the general framework of the law is a good is a good step, but what really matters is the implementation. And you know, definitely US businesses are concerned about having the letter of that law followed on the ground. Okay, so I'd like to turn lastly to, to tips for journalists since um, we are actually in the business of educating journalists. And I think it's an unprecedented time, both because journalists are now on both sides are being forced to depart. And so they have less access and less um, ability, frankly, to, to gauge populist, popular opinion and to have um, unscripted, um, unsupervised uh, you know, interviews and, 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 and conversations with the population. 
Um, and at the same time, in both countries, the the, the government um, uh, line has gotten harder and 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 more fixed, um, and and frankly, more strident in both countries. So, uh, what do you? And and finally, the, the the question of what is objectivity in journalism is is really under threat, not just um, in international relations, but in the way that we cover, you know, our own country. So. What are your tips for journalists, particularly with this objectivity and this highly partisan um, environment for how to do a good job and how to be both how to be fair, but also how to be perceived as fair? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a huge question. So, um, you know, when talking about the U.S. China, um, you know, there are some big reasons why we may miss stories. Um, the press corps getting kicked out from both countries, I think, is really a tragedy. Um, both for our professions and people in both countries. And it really increases our chances of misunderstandings that could lead to war, um, as we're talking about in this, in this panel today. Um, you know, there's really no replacement for being on the ground and talking to everyday people and the, the learning that comes from that. Um, you know, it gives you, as a journalist, it gives you empathy, it gives you connections on the ground that you can then go back to years later. And so, you know, it's really useful to continue to take a pulse on things. Um, I mean, that being said, you know, the US and China are global powers. So I do think for journalists, there's a lot of fantastic stories to do about the diaspora and, you know, the influence of these two countries around the world. Um, I, I think there are a lot of great stories about what everyday life looks like for people who are getting swept up in the start of this new Cold War. Um, you know, Chinese researchers who are in the U.S. doing cancer research or um, Belt and Road projects in Southeast Asia and Africa. Um, I was able to visit a Chicago factory where workers are now working for the Chinese state-owned railroad company and are, you know, instructed by Chinese shifus. So there's still a lot of great stories to do, even though um, the access of the press corps has been restricted. Um, thinking about objectivity, it's a huge topic now in the industry, and I think it's something journalists have to be extremely careful and mindful of. Um, you know, I find this growing distrust for major news sources to be extremely disturbing, um, and it goes hand in hand with um, things like Americans questioning the data on coronavirus Ill illnesses and cases. You know, a, a good proportion of people now think that those case counts are um, overestimated when in fact many scientists think they're significantly underestimated. Um, you know, so people throw around the term fake news as a joke, but to me it's really not a, a joke. It's an erosion of the foundation of our democracy. Um, so I think journalists need to respond to, to that by doing the best we can, you know, to capture the story absolutely accurately, to relay the truth. Um, at the New York Times we say without fear or favor, which I really love. Um, there's also, you know, this growing realization in the media industry that um, of a rejection of kind of simple both sides -ism. So just, you know, juxtaposing one quote from one side with a quote from the other, because sometimes one side is not um, telling the truth or being factual. And it's our responsibility as journalists to identify falsehoods and, and uh, misinformation. Um, and there's a big discussion of objectivity now with the Bla uh, Black Lives Matter movement and basically the realization that the press corps is very white and very privileged and that invariably affects the press's under understanding of what is objective and what is neutral. Um, so, you know, it absolutely underscores the importance for institutions of racial diversity as well as ideological and geographic diversity. Um, and especially in the U.S., with regards to US China, you know, having reporters of Chinese descent, people who are based in China, you know, absolutely essential for our institutions. Um, just um, finally, quickly, you know, that those are institutional issues, but what can reporters do on an individual level? Um, I think, you know, really start with a genuine curiosity and rigorously seek out opinions you don't necessarily agree with, give them a full and honest hearing. Um, question whether you're striking the right balance between trying to pique readers' interests and telling a great story and really capturing the full nuance because there can be a lot of pressure to put a flashy headline on the story um, to get more clicks, but um, you know, exaggerating something can really be a, a short-term strategy that damages um, credibility in the long term. And then another is just to really make sure you're grounded in data. Um, so the story you shared of mine about 
uh, which is all about um, the Trump administration's drive to reshore industry. Um, I mean, we really started by looking at the data and finding that in a lot of cases, you know, what's exactly happening right now with companies in the pandemic is kind of unclear, um, but there really isn't much evidence to, to suggest that um, companies are reshoring to the United States. Instead, there's a, there, it's very visible in the data that some companies are moving out of China to go to uh, other low cost countries, um, but, and some companies are staying in China. Um, so I really tried to, you know, stay grounded in the data there and capture that nuance. And I think that is a really powerful way, um, you know, to claim um, authority and objectivity. Okay. Well, thank you. I'd like to go back to Alan for a moment um, on, on some of this. Um, as um, Anna talked about, there's a trend in, in journalism and generally to, to avoid um, both sides-isms and, and, and ping-ponging between the two. Um, and again, I don't mean to make you totally the sponsor, the uh, spokesperson for Down Under, um, but how are, how is Australia and how are other countries dealing with the dispute over the factual basis of the relationship? You heard Dr. Jha saying, Americans are now accustomed to being lied to and they have accepted being lied to by the Trump administration and now those lies are spreading to China. And um, you know, you're hearing uh, Anna explain the ways in which fundamental uh, principles of objectivity are also you know, uh, under question and under fire in this country as never before. How, what does this look like from where you're at? Yeah, look, that's a good question. Um, the first thing I'd say is just to pick up on what Anna said that um, you have to look beyond the rhetoric of both sides. I mean, partisanship has become more extreme globally over the last you know, probably decade or so. So you you have to listen to what people say, but you have to actually look at what countries are doing in practice, okay? So, for example, if you're looking at um, uh, the South China Sea, as, a, as um, my colleague uh, Dr. Jia brought up before, so... I understand what China's position is. I've seen what the arguments of the various other claimant states are in, in, in Southeast Asia. I've looked at the US position. Then I actually look at, you know, what has actually happened. So there's an example of uh, a situation where I think that, that the Chinese government has been, you know, basically not only unwise strategically in doing what it's done, but militarizing disputed islands. Uh, contrary to international law and despite the resolution of the arbitration commission uh, in The Hague, you have to look at that and say, well, uh, I can understand as a strategist why China might want to do that, but I actually think it's counterproductive to China's interests. And I would argue to my Chinese colleagues that there's surely a better way. If, you've got a, if there's a dispute around the territory and islands, there has to be a better way of dealing with it. You have to actually reach some compromise with the other disputants. You can't just actually take islands and militarise it. So to me, that's that's a that's a particularly worrying issue from from my point of view. Looking at this as an Australian part of the region as to why China did that and what does that signal about China, the way China approaches problems in the future? Uh, is it might might is right? Is it if you if you want to take something to do it, you go ahead and do it. So I think that to me is one of the most clear cut cut examples of where I think China has has been criticised by many, many countries, not actually trying to come to grips with the dispute and work out some accommodation. Now, I know the Chinese response is, yes, we tried to do that, but the reality is that what they have done is actually taken disputed islands and militarised them, and, and now we've got a big problem. So I don't want to be singling out China, you know, for egregious behaviour, but that's the kind of way I approach things. Um, the other example I would give, so I, I mentioned to the before about the weaponization of trade. So that's a facts-based approach. So I look at, um, you know, I look at all those issues, those examples I gave you, the canola issue in Canada. I know the situation in Australia, but others with the Philippines. I look at what actually the Philippines said, what China said, what act actions were taken by China. Could you actually make a direct connection between uh, the strategic development that caused the charge to respond this way. I mean, most of the time you could. Yes, there's some, it's not always black and white, but you get, there's a trend that develops. You start to see the pattern of behaviour. If it was a one or two countries, you'd say, well, there are explanations for that other than one we're putting. When you see that happening consistently in a pattern across the whole region or even globally, 
you have to, you know, my, my conclusion is that China is modernising Australia to some degree. I'm not saying the US hasn't done it either, but if we're just talking about how China uses trade in a coercive way, that seems to be becoming more prevalent and more worrying for a lot of countries, particularly China's trade partners, one of which, of course, is Australia. Now, we've been very much on board the China growth story. We've benefited from China's right. We want to have a good relationship with China, but we're finding it very difficult to do so when China actually uses trade as a weapon against us when it doesn't like what we're doing politically or geostrategically. So that's the kind of way I approach these questions.